Ah, well, it goes back uh, quite a long time. When I was finishing high school, I had actually enrolled to do metallurgical engineering and uh, had been accepted by the university. And then during that year, a friend, my father, had died some years earlier, and she had a very uh, nice lady friend who'd been looking after her and helping her and she died suddenly of a hemorrhage in the brain and I was quite amazed nothing seemed to be able to be done and somebody gave me a biography of Harvey Cushing the great uh, neurosurgeon from America and I read that and I decided I wanted to do surgery so but I'd already been accepted by the university to do engineering so uh, my mother was enthusiastic about me changing and uh, we made an appointment to see the uh, registrar for admissions at the University of Melbourne. You can imagine my mother came with me <laughs> and we sat down in front of him and she said, well, Peter wants to do medicine. Would that be possible? And he said, well, certainly as he has a Commonwealth scholarship, he can change to do medicine. So that's how I came to do medicine. And then, but I was almost right from the beginning, I wanted to end up as a surgeon. And well, that came later because I, yeah, no, I never ended up being a brain surgeon. <laughs> but uh, so when I was quite late, uh, really finished my training when I got interested in transplantation because it was pretty primitive. It was happening back then, but I graduated in 1957 from the University of Melbourne and then I started my surgical training at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne and then in those days there was no complete training program in surgery so we used to all come mostly to the United Kingdom to finish our training, which I did too. And one of the jobs I had for six months was what at the Hammersmith Hospital or Imperial Postgrad Royal Postgraduate Medical School. And I was there when they did the first living unrelated transplant. And I must say, it was a bit of a shambles. Um, and in fact, I wrote to a friend of mine, so he says, he never will show me the letter, saying that I didn't think there was much future in kidney transplantation. <laughs> anyway, it's interesting, this unrelated transplant was between two uh, general practitioners working together in Newbury. And the one that had the tr so one donated his kidney to the other uh, partner, and um, he, the recipient died of because it was total body irradiation in those days. Died of overwhelming infection. This was back in '61, about a month after the transplant or something like that. But anyway, he was a very popular GP. So all the patients at Newbury start set up a fund in his memory to support the study of renal disease. Well, you know, years later, in 1974, when I came to the Nuffield Chair of Surgery in Oxford and had started the transplant unit in Oxford, the trustees of this foundation decided that as I was looking after patients from Newbury, that it would be very, which was in our region, appropriate to hand all the money over to the University of Oxford for my use <laughs> for research. So it's a small world. This was something like... Uh, 13 years later when I, because I went from London to Southampton, I worked to the USA for four years, four and a half years, and then back to Melbourne, to the Royal Melbourne Hospital where I first met Priscilla Kincaid-Smith, mm, the great nephrologist. Uh, mm. And swimmer. And yeah, so I was, got hooked, while I was working at the, I was working at the Mass General at Harvard, and um, there, Kidney transplantation had been started by a person named Paul Russell and it was very well done and very scientific and he was a good clinical scientist and I always want to be a clinical scientist, not just a clinician. And uh, so that triggered my interest in transplantation. I had been working on the immunology of infection, uh, so I switched to the study of particularly histocompatibility and then Another lucky break was that David Hume, the, uh, who was at the Brigham Hospital in Boston, had moved to be head of surgery at uh, the Medical College of Virginia, and he had established uh, 
probably the biggest transplant unit in the world at the Medical College Virginia. Anyway, he heard my job back in Melbourne had been temp put on hold because the University of Melbourne ran out of money. <laughs> Uh, universities are always having this problem, as you probably know. <laughs> and, uh, so my professor to be there said, could I stay where I was? And I said, no problem. Anyway, cut a long story short, David Hume had heard about this, said, would I come down and set up a tissue typing laboratory in his unit? And I uh, said, well, I'll come down and have a look. So I went down. And he had this huge minus 120 degree freezer full of sera from every patient he'd transplanted. And he'd done 100 transplants. This was back in about 1966 at that time. And he had sera from all these patients. And I said, uh, what's going to happen to all this sera? And he said, it's waiting for someone to come along who knows what to do with them. And I said, well, Dr. Hume, I know what to do with them. Can I have access to them? And he said, of course you may, if you're quite certain you know what to do with them. And uh, that's how I came to discover cytotoxic antibodies in patients after grafting and that they were associated with graft loss. But So that was a very lucky break I had. Uh, if my job hadn't been temporarily abandoned in Melbourne, I wouldn't have ended up in Richmond. I wouldn't have had access to those here. And anyway, so I spent six or seven months there uh, setting up a tissue typing laboratory for him and of course it was such a busy unit I saw a lot of transplants, helped with a lot of transplants and even did a couple and uh, so and then I went back to Melbourne and uh, set up tissue typing there again, became part of the new transplant team uh, with Vernon Marshall on the surgical side and then Priscilla Kincaid Smith on the medical side and she was a uh, really already an internationally renowned nephrologist at that time who was renowned for the histology of renal disease but she used to also examine process and examine all the biopsies from the transplant patients so we used to look at them together and that's where I learned so much about you know I'm quite happy looking at renal pathology because of Pr Priscilla Kincaid Smith's training yeah, I think, well, yeah, I was always curious. And then uh, in Melbourne, of course, I set up laboratories looking at the induction of tolerance to uh, transplants. Uh, we needed to develop microsurgical techniques, uh, which we did so we could transplant kidneys in rats, for example, and uh, did a lot of very elegant studies. And, um, and of course, in those days, you could do with you know, not a lot of sleep. <laughs> and that was good because, you know, <laughs> I could remember I'd do tissue typing and I'd go to theatre to remove the kidneys from the donor and then stay to put the kidneys in one of the recipients um, and then eventually get to bed. <laughs> it was a marvellous time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I haven't regretted anything that's happened to me. I mean, Though I do have to say that most things that have happened to me have been just pure luck. Uh, you know, I seem to have always been in the right place at the right time when things were happening. And that, you know, so luck always plays a big part in anybody's career, I think. And I had lots of luck. And then, you know, one day in 1973, I got a phone call from. Richard Dole, the famous Regis professor, he discovered the association between cancer and smoking, lung cancer and smoking, and he was the Regis professor here, which is like the super dean of the whole uh, medical school, and asked me would I be interested in the Nuffield Chair of Surgery in Oxford, and I said probably not, but I agreed to come and have a look, because uh, at that time I'd almost wrapped up negotiations with the University of Adelaide to the move to the Chair of Surgery there. So anyway, I came and spent two weeks here going through Oxford almost brick by brick and realised it was an opportunity second to none. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'd never worked in Oxford, so I didn't... No, I'd come here as a tourist once for one day. That's all I knew about Oxford. and um, So that's how I ended up in Oxford. So after that time, I... Uh, said yes, I would come, and that was a terrifically good decision. <laughs> well, I suppose 
three people who had uh, uh, a huge impact my career were Professor Claude Welsh at the Mass General at Boston. He was responsible for me going to the USA, actually, because when I was a registrar at St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, he came as a visiting professor. And in those days, a visiting professor used to operate every day for a month. Uh, and I was lucky to be appointed as his... I had to look after him as his senior resident for the whole time he was in Melbourne. And it was a fantastic experience. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, he said, you know, I know you'd like to come to the USA one day, just let me know. Anyway, I wrote to him and said, yes, I've, you know, I'm going to England for a year or two, I'd like to come to the USA. And then one day I got a phone call from him saying that Uncle Sam, that's the US government, had just drafted their senior resident to go to Vietnam, and would I like the job? And I said, yes. And so I went there after discussing it with my uh, boss in Southampton who was fully in favour and then uh, after a year as a senior resident I then went into the laboratory uh, doing research work and uh, some clinical work but mostly just research work and then so he was the first person then David Hume uh, or Jack Burke in Boston because he was my mentor uh, in my studies on the immunology of infection and he was a real lateral thinker Jack Burke and I think I got learned a lot from him about the fact that he was always thinking you know often tangents all over the place and uh, so I learned a lot from him then David Hume obviously down in Richmond Virginia and then finally Professor Morris Ewing who was to become my uh, professor back in Melbourne when I went back to Melbourne in 1967 Well, um, all the masters I've mentioned were surgeons. Uh, They're all academic surgeons, but one thing I learned particularly from Professor Welsh was that he never got cross with anybody, he never got cross in theatre, in the operating theatre. And of course, back in my days, so, you know, surgeons would have real tantrums in theatre, I'm not exaggerating. And even in my hospital in Melbourne, I remember, you know, the first case I assisted him at, everything was, Peter, would you just put a little bit here, please? Uh, sister, may I have a forceps? Thank you, sister. Uh, yeah, please, thank you. Would you pl I'd never heard anything like this. And he still finished this first major operation, the removal of a stomach, in an hour and 20 minutes, even though he was saying please and thank you. And, <laughs> and I remember him saying to me, uh, once that later on and years later he said Peter as a surgeon when you get into trouble uh, you'll know it before any of your assistants or your staff and he said never show any sign of anxiety because then they will get anxious so you just have to recognize it work out how you're going to handle this impending crisis but don't let any sign of concern or anxiety uh, be noticed by your assistants or your scrub nurses <laughs> and that was great and I've always practiced that and also in the laboratories the same thing you have to be nice to people and uh, I always prided myself you know as head of surgery I knew the names of even the cleaners on the ward and always spoke to them and I tried to get the students you know get to know everybody not just your colleagues but not only the nurses but also the cleaners they're an important part of any team in a hospital so I suppose that all the people I worked with were had that character I mean David Hume was a I mean I was only with him for six months but he was a very charismatic surgeon good-looking women loved him and he loved women too I guess <laughs> But when he went to uh, Richmond, Virginia, uh, segregation had just been broken down. But still, the black population of the hospital had their own restaurant, and the white residents had eaten another resident. Well, David Hume never had lunch. Uh, he just had a Coca-Cola machine outside his office. But when he heard about this, he just said, well, I'm going to have lunch 
So twice a week he'd go and have lunch in the black restaurant. He'd just sit there right in the black restaurant and the black residents would come around. And then when the white residents heard, oh, Dr Hume's eating lunch in the black, they came into the <laughs> black restaurant. <laughs> And after about six months when he established that uh, they were mixing well together, then he never had lunch again. <laughs> <laughs> he never used to have lunch. <laughs> so, you know, the, but he was a very charismatic person. And then Morris Ewing, another thing, he never worried you with administration. He said, you've got to do your research work, and your clinic work, I'll do all the administration. And, you know, he'd be there at seven in the morning working to eight at night at his desk doing all the paperwork and all I had to do was write grants, but I didn't have to do any administration. And that's another thing I tried to do when I became a boss man myself is uh, try and take the load off the research workers and the clinical scientists so they could devote themselves to their real activity. Well, I suppose I have... Well, I like people. Um, and I'm of average intelligence, and uh, I like what I do. But I always say that we need a better system of selecting students to go into medicine. I mean, I don't know about in France, but here they do these A-level exams, and you have to get a high level of uh, exam results to get in. And I say, well, you know, to be a good doctor, you need to have average intelligence, but you must like people. And if you don't like people, you shouldn't do medicine. But we don't select them. A lot of them, of course, are very unhappy or become poor doctors because they actually don't like talking to people. <laughs> or better still, even listening to people. You know, again, the good doctor listens. Mm. Well, it was, I guess, uh, quite unusual in Europe and Australia, and I'm including the UK and Europe, for there to be much academic surgery in the true sense. But when I went to the USA, it opened my eyes because there, uh, science in surgical departments was strong uh, and very productive and and I'd always wanted to do academic be an academic surgeon rather than just a surgeon who was uh, doing the same operations over and over and over again because uh, you probably don't realize most surgeons just do you know five or six operations over and over again <laughs> particularly in these days of specialization but so I always wanted to uh, do something that would keep me intellectually involved uh, and preferably in the area I was working in and of course transplantation is marvellous for that because all your research is related to transplantation, you know, the immunology of rejection, the prevention of rejection, the induction of tolerance, all this is relevant to actually what you're practicing clinically so that's why it really did appeal to me and I think now it's become both easier in some respects but more difficult to do good research because you're competing all the time with uh, you know, full-time scientists, etc. So you have to be very single-minded uh, and be able to divide your time. You have to be very well organized time-wise because if you're operating, you're not going to be in the lab, so you have to know, well, I'm going to be operating Monday, Thursday. Uh, I'll be doing on-call on those nights, and then I'm in the lab the other three days, but I can't be disturbed unless it's life and death. Uh, I must say, although that sounds good on paper, you're always being disturbed. <laughs> so. Uh, um, the other thing I think that if you're going to be a clinical scientist you have to focus your research one in the area in which your clinical work is centered and secondly have a relatively narrow area of research so you're not trying to do too many things at once.
I mean, as you get more senior, of course, you develop teams of people who do different things. But when you're starting off, you know, when you're a 30 to 35 year old, you want to be very focused on what you're doing. And if you're going to do clinical work, you have to have quite a narrow focus for both, I think. Yeah, well, I've moved in. I don't do laboratory research now. I mean, after I retired, uh, well, I retired from the um, Nuffield Chair of Surgery in uh, 2001. And then I was elected to be president of the Royal College of Surgeons in England, so I spent three years living in London doing that. And that was harder work than being a professor of surgery, I can tell you. The politics are unbelievable. <laughs> and anyway, when I finished that, uh, I got a grant to set up a centre for evidence and transplantation. And I thought, well, this sounds pretty interesting. And uh, it means I've had to learn a whole new discipline, actually. Um, essentially and uh, and that's very good it's kept my poor old neurons and not many left but kept them popping around a bit and uh, that's been quite fascinating and uh, in fact I often feel a bit embarrassed having spent my whole career in surgery without realizing that the basis of evidence on which we do so many things is so very flimsy <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess. <laughs> so I know, well, uh, I'm told transportation is no different to other disciplines <laughs> in medicine, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's a good question. I think I'd still be interested in transportation. It doesn't carry quite the excitement um, as it did when I went into transportation, but from the immunological point of view, from the research point of view, there are more questions to be answered than there ever were. So for somebody who's a clinical scientist, then it's a very good area to go, go into. Uh, another area is vascular disease. You know, as we know more and more about the biology of endothelium, etc., there's a lot of potential there. Um, in fact, almost any area of medicine with you know the development <laughs> research is driven to a very considerable extent by development in technologies I mean just talking to Pierre we were talking about gene-wide uh, genomic arrays uh, where they've just made a very fascinating discovery in one of the types of nephritis and uh, you know but the fact the technology is there to enable you to do that sort of study, which you couldn't do ten years ago or even five years ago. So, you know, the developments in technology mean that so much more can be done from a research point of view than was the case, you know, ten years ago. And this will keep happening. Technology keeps moving. Uh, we learn more. You know, knowledge in biology uh, doubles every ten years which is pretty scary, isn't it? <laughs> uh, hard to give a short answer to that, but ethics and ethical issues are a major part. A short question. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't require a short answer. <laughs> well, I mean, the ethics of transplantation is a huge area. In fact, you know, we have... Um, an association of part of ESOT called LPAT, Ethical, Legal and uh, LPAT, uh, Psychological Aspects of Transplantation. Anyway, I just know it as LPAT, but Will Willem Weimer from Rotterdam runs, and it's a, quite a big area, and they discuss not only legal, but particularly the ethical aspects of transplantation. You know, from the original ones, went around the diagnosis of brain death, for example, but more recently we have paying donors for organs, transplant tourism, there's just one issue after another. And then there are more subtle ones such as uh, with paired transplants, altruistic donors, so it is a big area of transplantation of the ethical issues. Yes, uh, well I suppose the biggest change that I saw was the uh, recognition of brain death as a diagnosis of death, uh, which occurred in the uh, early 70s. You know, different countries adopted that at different times, and not every country has 
adopted that, but uh, most countries in the Western world have that brain death established by definite criteria is uh, a diagnosis of death. So that was the biggest change that in my time that happened and then uh, we saw the application of tissue typing but particularly the introduction of newer immunosuppressive and more potent immunosuppressive drugs. Now they're certainly more potent at preventing loss of a kidney or a liver from acute rejection but in fact the long-term outcomes aren't a lot different to what we used to see with the old-fashioned azathioprine and steroids, uh, which is quite interesting. I mean, uh, uh, there's no real evidence that, you know, five, ten years out that the results are much better, although they're better in the short term. We rarely see loss of a kidney, for example, from acute irreversible rejection. We do where it's antibody mediated and there are certain reasons but overall it's an uncommon event to lose a kidney from rejection in the first three months after transplantation whereas it used to happen in perhaps 15 to 20 percent of our kidneys back in the 60s and 70s. So the newer immunosuppressive drugs have led to a marked decrease in the loss of kidneys and hearts and livers from acute irreversible rejection. But there are problems with all these drugs. There, as we often say in the UK, there are no free lunches. And uh, the side effects of many of these agents are many and varied. And, you know, so we're, as our patients live longer, we're beginning to see, you know, some of the problems associated with the long-term use of certain immunosuppressive drugs, some of which are toxic to kidneys, nephrotoxic but also an increased incidence of virtually all types of cancer uh, and especially those that have a viral etiology. So these are problems that we're now appreciating uh, that we have and that's why uh, so much effort's going in to try and produce the phenomenon called tolerance where a recipient would accept a graft, a kidney or a liver or a heart uh, without needing any immunosuppressive drugs other than perhaps, you know, for a few weeks. You know, it's the holy grail of transplantation. Now, will that happen in my lifetime? I think so, yes. I'm a little more cautious now because back in 1970, I produced tolerance in a rat to a kidney transplant uh, repetitively. And I was foolish enough, being young, <laughs> not so mature, to say to the media, that I'm sure that within 10 years we were producing tolerance in the clinic. That was in 1970 I said that. Well, we have produced tolerance in the clinic in selective, a few selective situations, but it's far from being anything. Well, apart from histocompatibility and everything that goes with that, uh, I mean, it was HLA in transplantation, HLA in disease, and then I worked with Jean Dorsey on a huge anthropological survey of using HLA as a genetic marker of the origin of uh, different races, which was fascinating. Uh, that took me up into the wilds of the highlands of New Guinea, <laughs> for example, and I spent six to eight weeks up there collecting blood samples from these uh, uh, highland natives who were still practicing cannibalism when I was there. Uh, it had almost been stamped out, but not quite. Um, but I suppose the other major interest in my research career was trying to induce tolerance, which we ended up being able to do it in uh, experimental models in animals uh, and of course using those animals to understand what was happening in the immunological response that resulted in tolerance rather than rejection. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm still optimistic that tolerance will be, uh, be able to produce in the clinic relatively safely and relatively routinely over the next 20 years. I'm hoping I won't prove, be proven wrong again. <laughs>
Well, I can tell you one, because uh, it's one that I uh, was reminded by, reminded of by a younger nephrological colleague of mine, Chris Winnells, just a week ago. Uh, and he said, Prof, do you remember sitting on the bedside? This was a patient I transplanted three months before. He'd had a stormy time with one acute rejection episode after another. This was back in about 19... 75 or 76 and I said to him Graham you've had a bad time uh, the biopsy looks awful and I think we should take the kidney out before we kill you with the additional immunosuppression we're giving you because I'd always learned Priscilla Kincaid Smith I remember her saying Peter remember it's better to end up with a dead kidney and a live patient than a live kidney and a dead patient. And that was uh, uh, something I practiced all my transplant career by, that uh, you, know, you can always live to fight again, but if you're dead, you can't. But anyway, I digress. So I said, and I said, we better get, and he said, oh, Prof, please, I've been on dialysis for 10 years. I don't want to have, let me take my chance. And he persuaded me to leave the kidney in, which I did. And then I had lunch with him just the other day, something 30 plus years later, that same kidney is still functioning. <laughs> and I use that as an example. I used to tell the students to show how ignorant we are, that we you know, think we know a lot, but we don't know anything really. And here's this patient that reminds me every time I see him. That, and after that, you know, he fathered three children who are now at university. And, you know, so that's one episode I remember vividly still. Mm. <laughs> okay, well, here's this is one that will appeal to, <laughs> appeal to uh, Professor Ronco. The, uh, uh, when I was in Melbourne, I used to operate uh, on uh, Professor Kincaid Smith's uh, patients that had a renal artery stenosis. Surgery on this was not practiced very commonly. Then I came to Oxford, and of course this sort of thing wasn't done. And George Pickering had just retired as Regis Professor, and he was a very famous hypertension man. He did not believe renal artery stenosis had anything to do with uh, hypertension. Anyway, after he retired, John Leddingham, who was one of the nephrologists in Oxford, asked me to see this man who had been senior technician of George Pickering for 30 years and uh, had had hypertension and was now on dialysis. Um, and John felt that he might have a renal artery stenosis, but he'd never had an angiogram. So he had an angiogram. He had one functioning kidney, where uh, one kidney rather, he had uh, a genetic absence of one kidney, and the one kidney he had, had a block, complete block in the renal artery. Uh, but the kidney was still being fed by collateral uh, flow coming in from outside, so it was fairly small, but it was viable. So, and discussing this with John Leningham, I said, well, I've done some of these cases for Priscilla Kincaid Smith, and they didn't always work, but some did. So I operated on this guy and um, uh, reconstructed the renal artery and its anastomosis to the aorta, and then within minutes urine started appearing and he put out five litres of urine in the next two hours in the catheter even before he'd woken up. So when I went home that night uh, my five children always want to know what I'd been doing all day if I got home in time that is to have dinner with them which more often than not I didn't but that day they said dad what have you done today and I said kids I've done a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been allowed to forget that, even, you know, 40 years later, <laughs> they're growing up with their own children now, but they keep, Dan, any miracles today? <laughs> so, what else can I tell you? I guess, uh, I'm just trying to think of something more transplant related.
I suppose when the a patient I'd transplanted had a, went on to have a baby, which was pretty rare back then. You know, it was back in the 60s, and that was uh, pretty exciting. And uh, they named the baby after me. So. <laughs> <laughs> when the baby's still alive, the mother's dead. Mm. I think I was always considered to have a very good relationship with patients. Uh, I used to pride myself on it, and I, I think, you know, when I've heard people, you know, talking about me, or, you know, introduce me, they always made this thing. Uh, in fact, two things they say: one, that I was very good with patients; secondly. I was a physician rather than a surgeon. <laughs> that was meant to be a compliment. <laughs> well, there's probably no such thing as a perfect physician, but a good physician, um, you know, in the broader sense, would be somebody who had an inquiring mind, who liked people, and obviously, if you like people, you're going to have a good relationship with your patients. So that's what I think they should concentrate. You know, it's interesting, we now teach community. One of the major problems that arise in medicine comes from poor communication with patients. And I'm actually at the moment president of the Medical Protection Society, which provides indemnity for you know, physicians. It's uh, not only in this country, but in Hong Kong, Singapore, South Africa, etc. And um, when I took this over from Lord Turnberg, he said, oh, Peter, you'll enjoy it. but." you'll learn about the soft underbelly of our profession. And I would say so many of the problems that arise with litigation are poor communication. Now we teach communication in the medical schools. We actually examine in the first exams they do, you know, be a surgeon you do two lots of exams over six, seven years. Uh, but communication is part of the exam. We have the actors who, uh, you know, they have to communicate with and the actors pretend various things are wrong with them. They're brilliant, but do you know more candidates fail that part of the exam than any other part of the exam? Mm. So it is quite an important problem and you know because we select doctors on the basis of their intelligence rather than anything else it's always going to be a problem. Mm. But that's a personal view and you know, not everybody would agree with me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the communication is part of intelligence. Uh, yes, but it's a bit more than... Uh, it is part of intelligence, absolutely, but it's a bit more than that. Mm. You have to have some empathy with the patient. You know, you have to... You can never know exactly how a patient's feeling, but you have to try and... try and feel as you think the patient might be feeling. Well, I again would change the selection process I would they have to have a certain standard of you know exam results at high school level uh, although I would personally favor having a mature student entry which now a lot of the medical schools are adopting here uh, in Oxford we now have a mature entry as well as a conventional entry but Oxford's a bit different because they do three years preclinical, but then they have to be interviewed to get into the clinical school, and only about 50% get into the Oxford clinical school. So we take students from Cambridge, uh, Edinburgh, etc. They have to have an honours degree, honours undergraduate degree, to be eligible to apply for the clinical school. So uh, in Australia, many of the medical schools have gone to graduate entry, and I'm very impressed with the standard because, you know. If a school kid's deciding to do medicine, they're deciding that when they're 17 or 18, which is ridiculous. Whereas if you've got an undergraduate degree, you know, it's going to be in one of the science, biological sciences probably, uh, and you want to do medicine, you're pretty sure that's what you want to do. And so they're much more dedicated to their work, much more interested in their work, and they're pretty sure they want to do it. So. There are two things that I'd like. If we're going to select kids from school, then we need to have some way of assessing whether they have the right personality to be a good doctor. We accept their average intelligence, and I said before, that's, you know, be a good doctor, you have to be of average intelligence, not more than that. Uh, 
and then I would like to see far more medical schools having mature entry. In other words, they'd done an undergraduate degree before they went into medicine. And I think then you produce people who are much better communicators. Mm. Because of commitment? Uh, both, commitment and maturity. You know, if you think back to your young days, you know, when you were 22, you were far more mature than when you were 17. <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> although, although, although you know, <laughs> girls mature much younger than men, but boys, you know, pretty hopeless at 17 or 18. No, mm. <laughs> you know, whereas, you know, by the time they're 21, 22, they're much more mature. Yes, uh, the two eldest did men. My son is, uh, eldest son's a paediatrician, and my daughter's a general practitioner here in Oxford. My eldest son's a paediatrician in Darwin in Australia. He went, uh, he did medicine at Bart's Hospital here, St. Bart's in uh, London, and then ended up in Australia, did paediatric training at the Royal Children's Hospital, and then he went to do a PhD. He was always interested in uh, infection in um, the third world. And um, so I said, well, why don't you go and there's third world medicine in Darwin, but you'll be able to live in quite comfortable surroundings. So he went and did a PhD in the Menzies Institute of Health Research, which all its work is on the Aboriginal Australian uh, health uh, problems. And uh, so he did his PhD and he's never left. And, um, and he's still working with uh, in upper respiratory tract infection in Aboriginal children, well, all children, but particularly all his research is in Aboriginal Australian children. Back home. Yeah, yeah, three have emigrated back home. So we've got eight grandchildren now in Australia and only four grandchildren left in England. So we go back to Australia at least once a year. But it's a long way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would uh, not dissuade them at all. I mean, it's very interesting, you know, a lot of people at my age and Pierre's age are saying, oh, medicine's all changed, not, don't do it. And I wouldn't say it's changed, but, you know, everything changes, you know, and uh, it's still a fantastic discipline to go into because you can do so many different things. Um, so I wouldn't dissuade anybody from doing medicine, but I try and ensure that they actually quite like people, as I said before, I feel quite strongly about that. So if they're fairly extroverted, and or not so much extroverted, because uh, uh, you know you can be shy and very nice, but if they have a nice personality and they get on with people, then that's important. But it is a long haul, you know, five years or I don't know how long it is in France now, but. Uh, it's mostly five years here and five years in Australia. But life is longer, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's only a tiny microcosm in your whole <laughs> lifespan. Well, at least you hope it will be. Yeah. <laughs> and what if the same person tell you, I love a kidney? I'd like to be a transplant surgeon. Yes, well, we don't. In fact, it's in, I have two medical students working, doing research projects with me at the moment who think they want to be transplant surgeons, and um, so they're working on transplant related projects. Um, but of course, they may well change. I said, you know, don't make up your mind to it. It's a fascinating area, but. When you graduate, you'll be exposed to more different types of medicine, and don't decide too quickly. Uh, and which they can do, because here, when you graduate, you do two years post-graduation of what's called a foundation program. That's two years where you rotate through medicine, different uh, specialties of medicine, surgery, and then you, towards the end of that, you can decide whether going to go into primary health care, general practice, specialist, be it medicine, be it surgery, or one of the uh, interventional disciplines such as radiology, uh, which is another fascinating area. 
in fact, you know, I'm, radiology, I mean, is an area that's probably advanced more than almost anything else. I say, not ro imaging is fascinating how that's changed in my lifetime. I just can't believe it. I mean, a couple of years ago, I flew back from, I had a pulmonary embolus, I had a major pulmonary embolus, and I ended up in the John Radcliffe here, and um, anyway, I had a spiral CT scan, uh, which is a radically new type of Im imaging, and, you know, took five minutes going through this, and there you see extended pulmonary artery, the clots in the lung. Now when I was practicing and when Pierre was practicing years ago, well he's still practicing, but when he was at the coalface so to speak, diagnosing a pulmonary embolus was either a clinical diagnosis or you did something, you probably remember a ventilation VQ scan. Well in Oxford the isotope only came once a week. So if you didn't have your pulmonary <laughs> embolus on the, sort of two days around that day, it used to arrive on Wednesday, it had to be a clinical diagnosis. Or sometimes we'd get cardiologists to do a pulmonary angiogram for us, which they hated doing and didn't like doing. But um, so, you know, that's a, an example of how interventional, or well, this was non-interventional imaging has developed so amazingly. Mm. You would hope you could still have a trend, doesn't it? I mean, I've had other examples. I mean, I had a patient, I'm sure he won't mention, mind mentioning name, Robin Eady, who uh, ah. just retired as professor of dermatology at um, St. Thomas's Hospital. Anyway, as a medical student, he went into renal failure, and there was no chronic dialysis in this country. Uh, this was before I came to Oxford, and um, he took himself off to Scribner uh, in uh, Seattle, who put in a Scribner shunt, obviously, <laughs> and took him on as a technician, employed him as a technician, so he kept him for about a year, I think. You probably know the story better than I do. Anyway, he came back uh, then to London, and the... London transplant surgeon said he couldn't be transplanted, he was highly sensitised, etc, etc, etc. Anyway, he then self-referred him, referred himself to me because I specialised in highly sensitised patients at that time and I said I thought we could transplant him and anyway, we, he'd been on dialysis I think 20 years and we transplanted him successfully and he's still going strong on the same kidney. In fact, I met him just recently at the cricket. <laughs> he's a nice guy, but he's a great example. Yeah. 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 Well, it is remarkable. I mean, another person, when I came to Oxford, Oxford had no transplant unit, but it had probably the biggest dialysis unit in Europe run by Des Oliver, Newman, and uh, his wife had been a patient of his for 20 years and she was on dialysis and um, he'd never considered having a transplanted and she, I think, felt so loyal to him she even didn't think about it herself and then eventually he persuaded her to let me see her with a view to transplant. Anyway, long story short, she had a transplant and it worked beautifully still going strong. Poor Des is dead now. Casting over the stomach. But... Yeah. Anyway, so... Yeah. <laughs> it can work. Mm. There is poetry in our profession. Uh, well, there's poetry of motion when you're doing an operation. Now, I well remember once when I was working at the Mass General in Boston and I was asked to assist this very famous American surgeon called Leland McKittrick who was then 75, 76, 77 and I was horrified that he was still operating. Anyway, when I assisted him, 
he said, well, Peter, it's very kind of you to, he said, I only operate on doctors now, I don't do any other operations, but they insist that I operate on them. And uh, he obviously knew I was a bit apprehensive about this, but he was 75, 76, and he was a beautiful surgeon. And he said, Peter, when you're assisting, just, it's like music. And he said, oh, it's poetry with a rhythm. So when you're tying the knots for me, one, two, three, one, two, three. And this whole operation took place, and it was amazing. And I was fortunate enough assisting him. He used to ask for me after that, and I assisted him two or three other times, and it was a fantastic experience. I mean, most people shouldn't operate after they're about 60, 65, in my opinion, but he was an exception. But he was physiological much younger because he never took an elevator under 10 flights of stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and there was only one person in the whole Mass General who could beat him at squash. So, although he was 75, 76, he was probably physiologically about 60. Because <laughs> you are a physician. Yeah, well, I've always been a good athlete and I uh, played cricket, uh, professional cricket when I was younger and uh, also baseball. Um, because in Australia, baseball's played in the winter time, not in the summer time. So a lot of cricketers play baseball in the winter to keep their eye in for cricket. Uh, you probably know nothing about cricket, so I won't go on about that. Uh, then I took up golf, uh, and I play golf regularly still. Hmm. So that's my, on the sort of non-athletic side, uh, I like music, and I particularly like opera, grand opera. And, uh, you know... Italian, yes, I'm a fanatic. Well, I was just very lucky because when we came to London uh, the first time in 1961, we were penniless and we had a little flat um, not far from Covent Garden. And in those days, you could get into Covent Garden right up in the gods for five shillings each. And actually, it cost about the same to go to a movie. So uh, my wife and I used to, because we didn't have any children then, trot down to the opera you know, about once a month and go right up. Anyway, when we came back years later to Oxford, we thought, what a bit nice thing. I'd love to go to Covent Garden, but sit in good seats. So I think on our wedding anniversary, I got seats and booked dinner, you can have dinner during the intervals <laughs> at Covent Garden and then in we went to these lovely seats in the stalls and I looked up where we used to sit <laughs> you know, 15 years before you could hardly see it we were so high <laughs> and that was the first time I'd seen grand opera you know, from those sort of seats but my wife was uh, very fortunate because when we were in London she was visited by an uncle who was a farmer from the outback of Australia, and uh, Uncle Dick. And he said, uh, and Joan Sutherland, she was the famous Australian, was singing um, um, Lucci de Lammermoor uh, in a week's time, would we like to go? And I said, well, Uncle Dick, there's no way you'll get seats for that. And he said, that wasn't the question, would you like to go? And I said, no, I can't go, I'm on duty. So Joss said she'd like to go, and I said, but you'll never get seats. I said, that's not the question. Anyway, somehow or other, he got seats, and my wife, they were sitting in the second row of the stalls for Duchy de Lammermoor, which was probably Joan Sutherland's most famous role, and she said it was unbelievable, and she took something like 20 curtain calls. <laughs> but I didn't. That, my first time sitting down in good seats was, you know, 15 years later, mm, or longer. Mm.